Okay, um, viewed through the dim mists of time, the Spanish-American War seems an unqualified success story. It was a popular war, a war to liberate the Cuban people from the oppression of wicked Spanish feudalists, and it seemed a morally acceptable war. In addition, it was brief and cheap, especially in terms of casualties, uh, even money. At the end of the conflict, John Hay, U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain, wrote, It has been a splendid little war, begun with the highest motives, carried on with magnificent intelligence and spirit, favored by that fortune which loves the brave. And so, of course, in that respect, it resembles the uh, recent Gulf War, no doubt. Historians have tended to treat the, um, this war as a sort of youthful fling, the lost weekend of American history, um, sort of the last innocent uh, phase in American history, I guess. And this uh, way of treating the war tends to deny it its full historical significance as a turning point. Uh, in the history of American foreign policy. The war's bloody sequel, the savage counterinsurgency in the Philippine Islands, has disappeared into a sort of Orwellian memory hall, not to be heard from again until the war in Vietnam, to which it bore great resemblance. So uh, the war has been done some uh, injustice. The war reflected, among other things, um, uh, the triumph of what Theodore Roosevelt and, and his cronies uh, called the large policy, which in effect was a policy of American empire, informal empire, empire on the cheap, by the exertion of American political and military force overseas to secure entry into markets, whether the people who happened to live in those markets were willing uh, or not. Set against the economic distress of the 1890s, the panic of 1893, and so on, and what Richard Hofstadter has called the psychic crisis of the 1890s, war also provided a handy distraction from domestic issues for the um, political leaders of the country at the time. Um, the war also created an independent Cuban Republic, uh, which actually functioned as a sort of satrapy uh, of the American economy uh, with the uh, Platt Amendment um, incorporated into the Cuban Constitution, allowing a sort of routine weekly American intervention if the Cuban elections didn't turn out right. And it uh, resulted in the cession by Spain of various territories such as Guam and the Philippine Islands and Puerto Rico to the um, United States, for which we then paid the small indemnity, the sort of consolation prize to the Spaniards of $20 million, sort of defeat them, take their land, and then pay them some money. It's some kind of tradition going back to, I think, the uh, acquisition of Florida. Okay. Um, at a less cosmic level, the war contributed several alcoholic beverages and some, some happy uh, sayings, uh, like fire when ready, gridly, uh, all of that. And um, the romance of the tropics played a role, although it was tempered by the um, notion that white people tend to deteriorate when deprived of the challenge of the Teutonic winter. Finally, it was the last American war fought without conscription, which probably... Uh, uh, adds to the happy uh, aura. But it was a new departure. Up to 1898, American expansion had been continental. It had been expansion into contiguous land, which you could argue, and most Americans believed, was in fact compatible, uh, however required, with uh, republicanism, because you could organize new territories acquired in this fashion um, into new territories on the model of the various Northwest ordinances, fill them up with settlers and uh, bring them in as um, reasonably sovereign states on the existing model. You can't do this with overseas or saltwater imperialism. So hence this is a turning point in that respect. So an empire of contiguous land had come into being over the objections of separatist elements such as Confederates, Mormons, Native Americans, that sort of thing. But it definitely, uh, from American point of view, it sort of extended the area of freedom and republicanism uh, despite that. So up to 1898, we could view our career of Indian wars, annexations, and gargantuan real estate deals as compatible with Republican self-government. It hadn't really undermined that, I guess, in any uh, critical sort of way. Now, what happens in the 1880s is you begin to get a, a group of people uh, saying this isn't enough. We, we, uh, we really need to strut around on the globe and exert our power and sort of do what the Europeans are doing, uh, you know, the follow the British model or something, have colonies, and you had some people wanted formal colonies, some people would settle for an exertion of, of force in such a way that we had a sphere of influence uh, 
But there was this um, propaganda coming from professors, politicians, missionaries, all sorts of people suddenly calling for, uh, in effect, expansion and the emergence of the U.S. into uh, global power and the rejection of the um, the best traditions of U.S. diplomacy uh, exemplified in uh, uh, John Quincy Adams' Fourth of July address and so on, the old America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy kind of thing, which... Uh, had at least influenced some policymakers some of the time. In fact, uh, there had been so little interest um, in um, playing a world role that uh, Secretary Seward had had a hard time getting the money to buy Alaska in 1867, although that issue apparently is on the table again, according to Mr. Zhirinovsky. So you have a number of people um, like Teddy Roosevelt, the, the ineffable uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, his crony... Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts, uh, Brooks Adams, uh, the brother of the more famous Henry Adams, uh, forming a kind of uh, expansionist uh, literary uh, coterie and writing numerous articles in favor of a bigger navy and uh, the sort of engrossment of markets uh, by political power, some neo-mercantilist conception, which we will, we will come to know and love as the open door foreign policy. Um, let's see... Uh, Brooks Adams, of course, um, in a kind of alliterative vein, says that nature is omnipotent, nations must float with the tide. Whither the exchanges flow, they must follow, and they will follow as long as their vitality endures. So one of these kind of vitalistic uh, arguments about destiny that were popular with this group, and you get a lot of this um, torrent of rhetoric about destiny from, um, again, Teddy Roosevelt and this whole group. Um, uh, Morrison Swift, who would emerge as one of the anti-imperialists, uh, very, fairly quickly uh, said that there never was such a scurvy thing as this destiny running around the universe. Signs should be erected everywhere, shoot it at sight. Uh, another theme was the sort of racial destiny of the Anglo-Saxons to go out and Anglo-Saxonize the world, um, to which uh, one, another anti-imperialist, an Englishman living in Canada, uh, Goldwyn Smith, said that well, he thought this was a misinterpretation of the role of the Anglo-Saxons. He wasn't against Anglo-Saxons, obviously, but he thought this was somewhat overdrawn. Um, let me see. I have a quote here from the Reverend Josiah Strong, who was one of the uh, expansionist uh, writers, saying that, uh, quote, Is there room for reasonable doubt that this race, unless devitalized by alcohol <coughs> and tobacco, is destined to dispossess many weaker races, assimilate others, and mold the remainder until, in a very true and important sense, it is Anglo-Saxonized mankind. That's a happy thought. <laughs> uh, now, the, the third theme, then, and in some ways it's more central one, perhaps, is the, um, the frontier expansionist theory of American history, which we can trace to Frederick Jackson Turner's essay of 1893. You had this sort of official... Um, closing of the, the, the land frontier, and I know the Department of the Interior issued some kind of statement that the frontier was ended, uh, sort of a silly thing, but um, I guess you could still get land. But a number of people panicked, and they, uh, Turner, in effect, argues that uh, much was important about republicanism and liberty had somehow depended in a causal way on the existence of this continuous uh, landed frontier, and without the landed frontier we would be in trouble and... Now we needed a substitute frontier, and this was going to take the form of uh, foreign markets. Then you had economic interests arguing uh, that they, they needed foreign markets desperately for their sort of overproduction. To get its overproduction under consumptionist thesis from a lot of the interest groups and economists, and it doesn't actually reflect any genuine violation of Say's law, but it does seem to work in the context of um, protective tariffs that, that some businesses, in fact, uh, were selling in the home market at a higher than free market price and then wished to dump uh, due to the economies of scale and the level that they had to produce that, wanted to uh, get rid of some, what in effect were surpluses at those prices overseas in foreign markets. So there's something to this, and I could cite the um, discussion in Schumpeter's imperialism about export monopolism, and there's some things in Mises that I think uh, work with this idea. But it doesn't actually matter uh, how valid the economic analysis was uh, as much as it matters that people thought uh, they were going to benefit from this. And you uh, even begin to see this in the populist movement. The populists suddenly want to res uh, reciprocal trade agreements to get rid of what they thought were grain surpluses instead of going out of farming. 
which they could have done, I guess. And um, you, so if you're going to get a, across the political spectrum, this idea that foreign markets are the panacea for American um, ills. And, of course, this interpretation owes a great deal to William Appleman Williams, uh, the late uh, uh, historian who founded the Wisconsin School, and Walter Lefebvre, uh, Lloyd Gardner, a number of other people, uh, and so on and so forth. So, apparently, the substitute frontier had to be found. But this required a neo-mercantilist conception of the nature of trade. This required the uh, building of a larger navy, the acquisition of bases near the markets, uh, particularly the fabled, uh, somewhat illusory China market. The idea was, there's, look at this, millions of Chinese out there, or Chinamen, I guess they were called then. And if every one of these guys bought a pair of shoes, you would sell a lot of shoes. So the manufacturers had this idea that there was this sort of unlimited China market, and we had to get in there, even though the Europeans had carved it up into spheres of influence, we had to use force and persuasion to get into this and, and other markets. Okay, so this is part of the, the intellectual background and what McKinley and his advisors are, are probably thinking when they when they come to power in the election of um, 1896, and the election itself being largely fought over sort of uninteresting issues like uh, silver and bimetallism and all that kind of thing, and a very divisive election. Of course, uh, the some of the Eastern groups thought it was that uh, the uh, Brian was virtually a you know, sort of anarcho-communist or something. So in any event, um, because of the, some of the domestic distress, you also get a, a theme of bellicosity. You get, uh, for instance, Mars, Henry Watterson, editor of the Louisville Courier Journal, saying that um, from a nation of shopkeepers, we become a nation of warriors. So this anticipates Werner Sombart's uh, Hendler und Helden, the uh, traitors versus heroes of 1915, a sort of manifesto of German social imperialism. So you, you begin to get this and... Uh, Watterson goes on to say, we risk Caesarism, but even Caesarism is preferable to anarchism. We risk wars, but a man has at one time to die, and either in war or peace, he is not likely to die until his time comes. Got an interesting argument. Uh, I don't know if it's really that valid. Now, one of, um, so a number of uh, foreign policy uh, crises or opportunities uh, come into play in these years. Uh, one is the, uh, the sort of pseudo-revolutionary uh, outburst in Hawaii where a number of, uh, I guess, pineapple growers form a revolutionary committee and depose the uh, sovereign uh, queen, uh, Lilio Kalani, and with the help of a, a group of U.S. Marines who just happen to be around, uh, uh, this revolution succeeds. As Walter Millis said, the Marines were landed on the admirable device of preserving order before it had been endangered. So then the uh, Hawaiian revolutionaries uh, petitioned for some kind of annexation to the U.S. on the Texas model, and the Grover Cleveland, bless his heart, just kind of tabled, tabled the thing when, when he came into office, so going back a little further. The other crisis was the boundary dispute uh, between uh, uh, Britain and Venezuela over the uh, boundary of um, British Guiana, and it had sort of, some people thought it had um, Monroe Doctrine implications, but the British basically just backpedaled and on the theory that someday they might need the Americans, you know, in a future war. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so they basically conceded all of the points. The third crisis, of course, is then the outbreak of um, another revolution in, in Cuba, led uh, by, oh my God, there's by uh, Maximo Gomez and Jose Marti, and directed from, by various Cuban hunters and revolutionary committees in places like uh, New York, um, Tampa, New Orleans, and Ocala. The cigar makers uh, in Ocala, Florida, and Tampa who had come in to get out to get under the tariff. So you had all this Cuban exile community, and uh, this, of course, is a sequel to the Ten Years' War of 1868 to 78, uh, another ill-fated Cuban uh, rebellion, and the Spanish feudalists had managed to retain power. Now the Cubans uh, rebel again in February of 1895, and Martí and these people land, and um, uh, he's killed. And Gomez, uh, the military leader of the Cuban Revolution, starts resorting to a um, sort of uh, policy of terrorism, burning down the uh, uh, sugar cane and all that. And so it's kind of brutal war, and the Spanish then resort to counterinsurgency, and they they could trench across, across the narrowest part of Cuba, La Trocha, to divide the western western part of Cuba from the eastern part, and then uh, and then begin the policy of reconcentración or uh, concentration camps, or strategic hamlets. You, you know, you heard the people into these 
enclosed areas so they can't support the gorillas, and then they die, that kind of thing. It's sort of like what we'll see in the Boer War soon after this, too. Okay, so uh, from the American standpoint, this is an opportunity and a danger. It's a danger to American lives and property uh, in Cuba. It's disorderly. Uh, on the other hand, it kind of recapitulates the derelict uh, province argument. The derelict province argument is that if there's uh, someone's colony is right next to you and they can't keep order, you're entitled to go in, and then that's what Andrew Jackson did uh, with Florida, essentially, in 1819. The Spaniards knew there was a precedent. And in addition, um, the policymakers from McKinley on down understood that if you got in a war with Spain over Cuba, if it came to that, uh, you had a certain opportunity to gain real estate, because Spain had the Philippines, and Spain had Guam and the Ladrones and so on. There was a certain opportunity if uh, the situation reached the point of warfare. So, uh, I'll have to uh, skip some, uh, keep this going. There's been a sort of interpretation that poor McKinley was a weak leader who was forced into this whole thing by the, the uh, I guess, the yellow journalists, the Hearst newspapers and Congress and other agitators. And apparently this is not the case. Uh, the more recent view is that McKinley knew what he was doing. He just didn't care who got the credit. There's a, a wonderful quote um, uh, from John Hay, who uh, writes to uh, Henry Adams about McKinley. I was more struck than ever by his mask. It is a genuine Italian ecclesiastical face of the 15th century. There are idiots who think Mark Hanna will run him. So in any event, uh, I would uh, send the side with the historians who, who believe that McKinley, in fact, knew what he was doing. And while he wasn't hell-bent for war, if he could uh, gain what he wanted without it, he was certainly prepared to use uh, Cuba as an opportunity uh, to implement a large policy, this policy of informal empire, and the, with the um, proviso in view that if you can get the Philippines, then you've got your coaling station, and you've got your sort of forward point facing the markets of China and Asia, which is what they wanted. Okay. Now, uh, the situation in Cuba uh, attracted the attention of American newspapers, congressmen, there's a lot of propaganda, uh, a lot of atrocity stories about what the Spanish were doing, and of course that wasn't really hard. They didn't have to make a lot of it up because the Spanish were committing atrocities, but then there were some that were made up anyway, uh, just to sell newspapers. And the Cuban hunters in the U.S., of course, contributed to this propaganda war. So you begin to get uh, calls in Congress that, that we should intervene altruistically and liberate the Cubans and do all sorts of good deeds. And it creates a situation in, in which it's possible for McKinley to go to Congress in May of 1897 and ask for $50 million for relief of American citizens in Cuba. And, of course, if they don't have to be relieved, this can also go into a war effort uh, as needed. Um, let's see. Partly in response to the alarmist reports of Fitzhugh Lee, former Confederate officer and U.S. consul at Havana, about imperiled Americans, the administration dispatched the battleship Maine to uh, Key West, which was then to be sent on to Havana Harbor. And in the meantime, as this is, um, the boat is lumbering over there, you have the uh, DeLome letter in which the Spanish uh, minister to Washington uh, writes a private letter criticizing McKinley, and this is published. It's somehow picked up by the Cubans or someone and published, and they have to recall the minister, so it creates uh, worsening relations with Spain. In the meantime, uh, the battleship Maine explodes, in Havana Harbor with the loss of 260 American lives, and you have the slogan, Remember the Maine, and the public tends to blame um, the Spaniards, although what the Spaniards would have had to gain has never been explained. The most recent inquiry, as I understand it, in 1976, uh, in effect says it was an internal explosion, uh, which is what the Spaniards said in their inquiry. In any event, this uh, contributes to the situation in uh, Roosevelt, who is Undersecretary of the Navy, uh, cables to Dewey to be ready to descend on uh, Manila as Dewey out there in the Pacific uh, poised, just in case this, this stuff works out. Um, so you begin to have uh, a lot of calls in, in Congress for war. And McKinley, of course, is taking his time. He has a certain way he wants to orchestrate it. And he's uh, got a certain level of pretended uh, negotiation with Spain. And this is the... Um, the George Bush method, and this is where you, you go to the Spaniards or the, whoever the foreigners are, and you say, well, these are our, our minimal demands, and then they agree. Then you say, well, we have actually we have five or six more, and we, we really can't meet you in Baghdad. We have a golf date, that kind of thing. So it's sort of self-sabotaging demands so that the Spaniards never quite concede enough. Seems to have been how, how this was played. 
In any event, uh, the Spaniards make all sorts of concessions. They're beginning to say, well, we'll grant uh, Cuban autonomy. They weren't quite ready to give it up as a piece of real estate. And, you know, we'll cease the military efforts, have a ceasefire with the Cuban rebels and so on and all of that. But for some reason, this is no longer enough. So, as I say, it's somewhat like the mysterious self-sabotaging diplomacy of the Bush administration. Well, McKinley asked Congress on April 11, 1898, to empower the president to take all these measures to secure termination of hostilities in Cuba and so forth. And the Congress responds with a four-point resolution, which gives McKinley what he wants, but also adds the so-called Teller Amendment, which is a restriction that basically renounces U.S. claim to sovereignty over Cuba. And this is later a problem. They wanted to get around that, so they invented the Platt Amendment and forced the Cubans to put it in their constitution, saying that we can intervene ever so often if we want to. Uh, so that got around it, but this was sort of a uh, self-denying ordinance that uh, Congress put in the, in the picture. Okay, um, now the military history, I'll, I'll be very brief on that. Uh, it's, it's fun, but uh, we don't have time. Uh, Peter Finley Dunn's Mr. Dooley remarked that the U.S. thought the war in a dream, but fortunately the Spaniards were in a trance. This uh, worked out very, very well. Um, so Dewey is poised at Hong Kong to proceed to Manila, and meanwhile, the army is undergoing an uh, interesting, uh, hadn't been mobilized for a while, uh, not since <laughs> the 1860s. And they had all sorts of logistic problems, and they would send winter uniforms down to Port Tampa, and it was hard to match the guns with the ammunition. It was a logistical nightmare. So they're, they're sitting there uh, around Port Tampa. The officers are hanging around Henry Plant's uh, hotel, and the troops are all off getting a venereal disease in Tampa and because there's delays getting the boats ready and so on. So that's kind of a nightmare. They finally get the expedition launched um, uh, in, um, let's see what the date is, well, it's April, um, and go over towards Cuba. And one of the considerations is that they don't want to be in Cuba in the rainy season. They remember what happened to the British in 1763. You know, they haven't worked out the whole malaria, mosquito, yellow fever thing at the time, and there's a real problem with having your guys marching around in Cuba in the rainy season. So they had this problem. They had studied what the British had dealt with uh, when the British seized Havana in uh, 1763. So they're trying to get over there. And on June 22nd, 6,000 U.S. soldiers land in Cuba at Dacry, led by 300-pound weight challenge General Rufus Shafter. Uh, one of the things that they had done, by the way, this is to get over the light unpleasantness, was they uh, deliberately enrolled a couple of... Uh, uh, high-ranking former Confederates in, in the effort got them to put on the wrong uniform and then go over there. So one of these is um, Fighting Joe Wheeler, former Confederate brigadier and an Alabama congressman, and he's in Cuba. The first blood is drawn by the Americans at Las Guasimas. It's really more of a skirmish than a battle. Seeing the Spaniards in retreat, Fighting Joe Wheeler uh, forgot himself and shouted, Come on, boys, we got the damn Yankees on the run. <laughs> and uh, of course, he, he laughed about it later, too. Uh, so now it's decided to capture the Spanish fortified city of uh, Santiago. And, of course, there's, uh, well, we've got the military details, but there's the whole thing of taking the San Juan Hills and the uh, misnamed, uh, it's actually Kettle Hill that Teddy Roosevelt, when he charged up there all by himself, um, took. And um, Lefebvre points out that it was very bad military uh, Apparently, Roosevelt had uh, more bluster than tactics. He charges up the steep hill uh, with, with all his men and, and in full view of the Spaniards. But fortunately, the Spaniards had very uh, obsolete rifles. They, they couldn't shoot fast enough, so the Rough Riders got through the whole thing. And meanwhile, the uh, Negro 9th Cavalry and 10th Cavalry actually took the, 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 the major hills. <laughs> so, but Roosevelt forgot to mention some of these details in, in, in his uh, book the Rough Riders, which someone said should have been called alone in Cuba. Okay. Oh, another war buff. Uh, Winston Churchill is over here about this time, a little bit before this. He's over there sort of hanging out with the Spanish officers, sort of learning about this kind of stuff, which he can then apply, I guess, in the Boer War when he is a correspondent in the Boer War, but he's out there getting his taste of uh, this kind of thing. Okay. Anyway, the, uh, the, the, the hills are taken and so on, and the Americans basically want to get a face-saving... Um, uh, uh, settlement for the Spaniards, get the bar over, get out of there before everyone dies of tropical disease. And Secretary Alger, of course, is in Washington, safe, breathing fire, but unconditional surrender. 
but they do arrange a, a surrender, and that's the end of the campaign. And what happens, of course, in the uh, there's a brief naval battle too, in which the various clunky wooden Spanish frigates are sunk, and that kind of thing, with like more or less next to no American casualties and a bunch of Spanish casualties. Same thing happens in the battle of, at Manila. 400 uh, Spaniards drown or die variously, no Americans, and so on. So it's one of those uneven uh, conflicts. Um, so, so very quickly, the, the uh, Battle of Manila is over, and it's actually, I guess, uh, fought after the Spanish have conceded. It's one of those communication things. And so then we have the problem of what to do with the Philippine, uh, because, because there's been a rebellion going on uh, since about 1893 or two in the, the Philippines that kind of been on hold. So the Filipinos have been led to believe that the Americans are liberating them, and now the Americans suddenly appear to be wanting to uh, sort of acquire the Philippines. So the Filipinos then proceed to uh, uh, fight a, a, a guerrilla war against the Americans. The Americans suddenly adopt all the uh, Spanish tactics of Butcher Weiler uh, in dealing with the uh, Philippines, so-called Philippine insurrection. That's what it should be called the Philippine-American War. That takes. So this is the uh, sort of unintended consequence. We have this sort of Vietnam-like guerrilla war. Uh, to uh, actually uh, physically keep the Philippines after we sort of told Spain we want them and given them the money. So to actually acquire the Philippines effectively, we have to kill about 200,000 Filipinos if you count starvation and uh, all the other incidents in this war, not just gunfire. And then we send them Yankee school arms uh, and social workers after we kill about a quarter million of them, so it worked out okay. Uh, very nice. Uh, sort of pattern there that we see in American history sometimes. And of course, uh, this began, this led to the, um, uh, and some debate, it actually never entered the electoral sphere because uh, when uh, Brian runs again in the next presidential election, he basically stays away from the issue, so you don't have a mandate for empire. You basically have McKinley re-elected on sort of boring tariff and other issues. But in the press, you had the emergence of the Anti-Imperialist League, and these are basically a set of classical liberals, some of whom had ties to the anti-slavery uh, movement in the North. They're kind of a Northeastern Mugwump civil service reform sort of group who see that there's a problem with uh, classical liberalism and Republican values if you start acquiring overseas territories and start ruling um, you know, foreign peoples by decree and force and, and you get into that whole contradiction there philosophically. And meanwhile, the administration is treating the Filipino insurgents somewhat like the Apaches or something and... Uh, so they begin to, uh, the Anti-Imperialist League, people like Edward Atkinson, um, uh, Moorfield Story, and so on, begin uh, sort of retailing various atrocity stories, which in fact are true, from the Philippines, talking about the mass graves and uh, just wiping out of villages. Famous order, I think, from General Thunston, kill anybody uh, uh, over the age of ten kind of orders, that sort of thing. So, um, okay, um, well, a brief little bit of... Um, uh, I don't have time to, I guess, quote Mr. Dooley, but there's a wonderful Mr. Dooley quote uh, about the paternal embrace of the Americans, but it turns out to be more like a wrestling match. And there stands Hennessy with the indulgent parent kneeling on the stomach of his adopted child while a delegation from Boston based him with an umbrella. I'm not much of an expansionist myself. So. Um, Lenin, of course, called the Anti-Imperialist League uh, the last of the Mohicans of uh, bourgeois democracy, but then he had a different theory of how this stuff works. Uh, that was kind of a compliment coming from him. So uh, McKinley decides that we have to acquire the Philippines. We really have to have them. Uh, and, and he's sort of, he's had that um, prayer session with God in the White House, and God told him we had to have the Philippines because they needed to be, uh, the Filipinos needed to be Christianized. No one had told McKinley, apparently, that they were mainly Roman Catholic already. That's uh, one of the problems. Um, so, uh, in any event, um, oh, this is a shame. I'm not going to have time to get my uh, southern stuff in here. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, part of the, uh, some of the anti imperialists were in the South, and there were certain comparisons made uh, to carpetbag rule uh, by a couple of southern congressmen. Uh, some people like, well, Tom Watson, for example, was sound on the Philippine Wire. Uh, there were a number of people. Uh, Pitchfork Ben Tillman had a few things to say about it. So you had a kind of uh, um, opposition. Mrs. Jefferson Davis, too, I have a quote I won't have time for. Mrs. Jefferson Davis emerges as a kind of anti imperialist, too, at the same time. So that's kind of interesting. She's still alive. So um, let me see. Oh, let me give you the, exact, the actual costs, if I can take a half a minute. Oh, we, no one's got anything statistics yet. Here's the actual costs. U.S. deaths, 2,900, some of which are battlefield deaths. The rest are due to bad food and uh, tropical disease. 
uh, 2,900 deaths, $250 million, okay? Uh, the Philippine insurrection, of course, cost six, uh, I'm sorry, 250 million, 600 million for the Philippine insurrection, so it actually costs more than the war against Spain to suppress the Philippine Bible. So that's the impact studies were done. And um, in summary, then, I guess I'll outrun my time, but what we have is a precedent for the whole um, policy of open door empire. Uh, the, set, the stage is set, we have the bases, okay. In, in Asia and so forth, and leading to all of the wonderful foreign policy disasters uh, since then. Thank you.